covenant declared, first of all, that the Ummah is open to all individuals, committed to its principles and values, regardless of their religious faith. So it said, this is a covenant among the believers and the Muslims of Quraysh, of Yathrib, this particular tribe, and those who followed, joined, and labored with them. It said, the believers, whether of the Quraysh, of Yathrib, and all individuals of whatever origin, who have made a common cause with them, all these shall constitute a community. Later on it says, it emphasizes cooperation between Muslims and non-Muslims in establishing justice and defending Medina against foreign aggression. The Jews must bear their expenses and the Muslims must bear their expenses. Each must help the other against anyone who attacks the people of this covenant. They must seek mutual advice and consultation. If they are to make peace, as in the people who are fighting them, if the covenant is broken, if they are to make peace and maintain it, then they must, they must do so. And so on and so forth. I won't go into too much detail, there's a lot of material on that. In, in summary, I think, what I'm trying to say is that the political system envisaged by Islam was both democratic and plural. And I'm using the term democratic in its original sense, implying the full integration of the people into the framework of governance. I'm not necessarily saying that there is a, an endorsement, automatic endorsement of party politics. <clears throat> In terms of the codification of the Sharia, it was only after the death of the Prophet that we began to see developments where the Sharia came to be kind of formalized. And you should remember that much of the written codification of law and the proliferation of different legal schools occurred in the context of what Robert, Robert Crane points out were really Muslim empire systems which operated on principles that were largely different to the principles of Islam and prophetic practice established in the Medina Covenant. The development of these, this body of legal opinions that we often identify with the Sharia therefore occurred in a very specific social and political context. Many jurists often had very little choice but to seek the protection and payroll of particular Muslim rulers, governors, monarchs, and even and dictators as well. They also formed their interpretations on the basis of very specific historical circumstances and, and specific problems that faced these rulerships. So we need to be very, very clear about the distinction within Islamic thought between the rulings that we now identify as belonging to Sharia law and the authentic sources of knowledge from which these rulings are supposed to derive the Quran, which Muslims take as the revealed book of God, and the traditions of the Prophet, whose words and actions specify and elaborate on the meaning and implications of the Quran. There were hundreds of different juristic schools of thought within Islam that developed over the centuries. And a lot of you may be very familiar with this, just in case I'm going to cover the, cover the ground. For the five with the largest following are as follows, the Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, Shafi and Jafari schools. These names were derived from the names of the scholars who, whose teachings and writings form the basis of these schools. Between these different schools, there are different views also about the, the sources and sciences of deriving legal opinions from the Quran and prophetic traditions. So the four Sunni schools, for example, emphasize following the Prophet's companions, whereas the Shia school emphasizes the Prophet's family, and so on and so forth. Also, they differ in terms of methodology. The four Sunni schools emphasize ijma, consensus, and Qiyas, analogy, whereas the Jafri school gives less significance to Ijma and it's instead emphasizes the role of Manti with logic, not as a source of law independently, but as a method of discerning the com 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 compatibility of legal rulings with the Quran and Sunnah. So that's a very quick summary of, of the kind of method method methodological issues we're looking at. The upshot of all of this is simple. The legal opinions of Islamic scholars are not the same as divine laws. And it is something that, that Muslims need to really absorb. They are fallible human attempts to abstract from the Quran and from prophetic practice legal solutions to individual social, ethical and political problems in highly specific historical contexts. It so happens that much of this context pertains to expansionist Muslim empires. Forms whose, the, the forms of political and even religious organization of these empires often departed dramatically from the principles established by the Prophet, and I gave them an example of the Median Covenant to illustrate this. The rulings of this period, therefore, shouldn't be taken at face value. They need to be firmly assessed and reassessed against the original Islamic sources in the form of the Quran and the prophetic traditions. 
Now, to summarize the general um, kind of trend lines of thought on jihad specifically in, 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 the, in the classical scholarship, I'm going to quote from two Western scholars, and uh, they're broadly correct in what they're saying. But I'm quoting them because basically they summarize, it for, they summarize the point that I want to make very easily. Patricia Crone, she's a professor of Islamic history at Princeton, and uh, she's written some other things about Islam which I don't agree with. But at this point she's quite accurate. She says, the normal type of jihad seems to be missionary warfare. That's how you find it described in the classical law books from about 800 to about 1800. What the Quran has to say on the subject is a different question. The rules that the Quran presupposes seem to be a good deal more pacifist than those developed by the jurists and exegetes. But it was the work of the latter, she says, which came to form the Sharia. So on and so forth. Similarly, another scholar by the name of Louis M. Safi, who's from George Washington University, he writes, the classical, the classical doctrine of jihad relied on propositions that were predicated on a set of legal rulings pertaining to specific questions which arose under particular historical circumstances, namely the armed struggle between the Islamic State during the Abbasid era and the various European dynasties. He goes on, the classical jurist did not intend to develop a holistic theory with universal claims. The doctrines of jihad were developed in the first three centuries of Islam and were influenced by the political structure of the day and by the imperial politics of the Roman Byzantine Empire. The classical doctrine of jihad and its corollary theory of the two territories, which I've mentioned there, are the products of their time and should be understood as such. So essentially what they're saying is that these were limited. It's not, it's not instant. What they're saying is not even that they're necessarily wrong but they were very specific to people who were trying to respond to the problems of the time. The issue of whether we think that these were even correct in that context is another thing. We will come back to that. Now what I'm going to do is give some examples of um, where we had cases where some of these doctrines were particularly, I would say, what, uh, kind of disturbing. These were, and these were minor. Mm -hmm. Ahmed Ibn Taymiyyah was uh, one of the classical Islamic scholars of the time, writing in the, around the 13th century. And his ideas have been used uh, very much by people we consider to be extremists. Um, Osama bin Laden and the people around him will come back to that. And that, that's not to say that Ibn Taymiyyah, if he actually you took him out of his past and let him see what people like Osama bin Laden have said, it's not to say that he would endorse that. But people have used it in that way. I'm just going to go, but I'm going to kind of go through a particular text um, which is translated, the title of the text is called Governance According to Allah's Law in Reforming Both the Ruler and His Flock. And I'm going to read through some of it. He quotes this particular verse in, of the Quran, which, as you can see, if you read it just like this, does seem problematic. And this is what he says. He, he talks about the obligation to do jihad against the unbelievers, Kufar, the enemies of Allah and His Messenger. For whoever has heard the summons of the Messenger, the calling of the Messenger to Islam, and has not responded to it must be fought. I'm reading from his text now. The Sharia enjoins fighting the unbelievers. If a male unbeliever is taken captive during warfare or otherwise, then the head of state may do whatever he deems appropriate, killing him, enslaving him, releasing him or setting him free for a ransom, etc. If a rebellious group, although belonging to Islam, refuses to comply with clear and universally accepted commands, all Muslims agree that jihad must be waged against them in order that the religion will be God's entirely. The most serious type of obligatory jihad is the one against the unbelievers and against those who refuse to abide by certain prescriptions of the Sharia, like those who refuse to pay zakat. 